we've sort of gone backwards in a sense, I think, over the last several decades. And science, the public may be less educated about science than they were decades ago. Maybe that's not true. But in any case, somehow we have to uh, make clear that this is not a matter of belief, that the, the fundamentals are so clear. There can still be many interesting details which are still to be worked out, and we will find some surprises. But the fundamental um, factors are, are now so clear, and yet the public doesn't know that. Uh, I don't really have a very good answer to your question. Who's going to sit up here next, and then we'll go over here. Thank you. I think it's implicit in what you've said and written, but I'd just like to emphasize that it seems to be possible that talking about global warming has perhaps been somewhat of a mistake in our attempts to educate the public. Because, you know, uh, this morning it's sort of cool. Uh, I had cool days in July, but global warming. And the variation issue is a subtle issue for many people. Whereas the facts of the matter about the CO2, they are just plain measurements. And, and the models, you can criticize, but the actual physical facts are much harder to criticize. And if you emphasize more about the CO2, not that we don't talk about it, but if that were the primary focus, the goal of warming a secondary one, it might have helped our causes. Yeah, well, the thing is that they will, then the contrarians will say, well, more CO2 is good. Plants grow better as a fertilizer to plants, so. Uh, you know, I recognized that problem before I testified in the 1980s. So I made these colored dice to show that the, although the warming is smaller than the variability, it affects the probability, it, it will affect the probabilities, and it has affected the probabilities. And I, I think that, but, but that's, that's one concept, but not sufficient. But I think what's more powerful is to show the maps of the world. So then you have a cool season in a given place, cooler than normal, and, but then you look at the global map and you say, well, that's a small fraction compared to the area which was warmer than what used to be normal. Um, and so that Mother Nature is, is going to be helping us make this clear over, over time, over the next decade or two as, as it becomes more apparent. But the, the difficulty is that this inertia effect and the fact that it's, we may pass tipping points. So it, um, yeah, it's it's a public education problem um, because it's clear that the politicians are not leading. Uh, there has to be pressure on them, and um, it's really it's really uh, hard. So most. People, when I explain this concept, well, you've got to put a price on it. If you don't put a price on it, you cannot solve the problem. If you don't put a price on the emissions that are causing the problem. And yet, there's no way the public will allow a price that's large enough. Because they can. They can uh, affect what Congress does and what uh, the president can do. So I, unless we... I think that when Obama became president, he had an opportunity. If he had really, he said he understood this, that he had a plan in the world, and the climate problem, the uh, addiction to fossil fuels, our dependence on foreign sources of energy, and our national security, all of these have the same solution. Move to clean energies and become a leader. In, uh, in building these clean energy so we can sell them to the rest of the world. But he, he would have had to explain that the only way that's going to happen is if we put a price on carbon and it's going to have to rise to a significant level. If it's not significant, it's not going to change your habits. Uh, but he didn't do it. Why do you so think it's a Sorry, It's you, you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. Then you're next, and there's a gentleman in the back, and then Art. Um, well, it, since we're in a position to 
influence a lot of members of the public. Can you recommend a website that contains a lot of data and pictures or whatever has been shown to actually influence the public into changing their attitude towards whether this is a real phenomenon or not? Well, we don't. I don't think the optimum website exists for that purpose. For the purpose of communicating among us, among physics teachers, the, the uh, website realclimate.org is very good, but it's not at the level where John Q. Citizen is going to uh, read it. Uh, it would, um, it would, it would be a big effort to make that that uh, website. Um, you know, this is this is communication thing is really hard. That, that was why I decided to write this book, uh, Storms of My Grandchildren. I thought, oh, I can write a book in which I'll put a little science in each chapter. And but what I found is that, well, the people who are well educated, you know, an engineer or someone in science, but not in climate science, will say, gee, this, this was okay, but I had to read it twice to understand it, and the public, uh, it was not on the proper level. Um, it's, it's hard. I, uh, where, where up in the back here, please? So, Dr. Hansen, I, I believe that uh, I, I really want to thank you for all of your presentation and the very convincing data and the and it seems like one of the really important things that we have to deal with in this struggle is probabilities and time scales. And uh, so you presented some data and you presented some possible solutions. So now here's my question, which is, what is the probability that these solutions will be implemented? And what is the time scale for the implementation? What is the time scale for implementation? Oh, for the time scale for implementation. Yeah. Yeah, that, well, that, first of all, to comment on your uh, first uh, statement about the time scale. Yeah, that is really a concept which the public does not understand well. And because they say, and for example, the NASA administrator said on National Public Radio that why should we worry about human made climate change? Because there have been much larger changes in the Earth's history. Uh, and um, how do we know that this is the best climate for, for people anyway? But that, that's true, that there were much larger changes, but those are on completely different time scales. Uh, they're very useful time scales for helping us understand the system, but the, the human time scale is really very short. And uh, the time scale that we have to get the actions that are needed. Uh, well, these court, you know, I mentioned the legal approach. There are cases being filed in several states and hopefully on the national level and in, several, in a few different countries. Legal cases against the governments for not doing their job. Those cases have attached, the, the legal uh, papers have attached to them this draft paper, uh, the case for young people and nature, uh, in which we show that if you started next year, if you want to get back to 350 ppm by the end of the century, you would have to reduce CO2 at about 5 to 6 percent per year, CO2 emissions. And if we started several years ago, it would have been 3% a year. If we wait 10 years, then you'd have to reduce it 10% a year, which is, of course, impossible. So we're, we're probably, unfortunately, we may pass the point where it's feasible, in which case you're forced with the issue of geoengineering, if you want to avoid instability of ice sheets and other uh, consequences. Uh, yeah, so the time scale for action is is uh, it's very short. We really need to start in the next few years to get on a downward path. 
All right, please. It may be time for one or two more. All right, I agree with you that carbon fee, that a carbon fee would be more effective than a carbon tax. But why do you think that a fee would be more palatable to Congress than a, than a market-oriented carbon tax? Well, um, it's not. <laughs> because Congress wants to be able to divvy out things to, you know, if you look at the Waxman Markey cap and trade or the <coughs> Kerry Boxer cap and trade bills, they had all sorts of giveaways <coughs> to the utility industry, to the fossil fuel industry. Uh, <coughs> so you're never going to get the solution that way. And they also had offsets. Uh, so that the re actual reduction was very small in emissions. So you simply can't solve the problem that way. And it's not, it's, it's going to have to be a system that's designed for the public, not for Congress. And that's, that's tough. Uh, that's, as I mentioned, it, it would take a leader who, when, when Obama had 70% rating, if he had used the Roosevelt approach of fireside chat, explained the situation, as Jim DePeso said, the Republican for the Environment, it's a one-minute elevator talk to make clear what is needed. But when I was on uh, David Letterman, you know, you don't have time for the one-minute elevator talk <laughs> when you're talking to the public. So, but you, the president would have. He can, he can go on national television and, and give a, but that didn't happen. I don't know. So you got to One more up here. Would you like to have a conversation with the question? Yeah, please. Uh, I'm from China, a uh, professor uh, of physics uh, in Fuzhou University, built up uh, in 1901 by America. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for, for your attention, China. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, Chinese uh, people and the government made every effort on uh, success energy. So in Suzhou City, uh, there's a yeah. industry district by government and the simple Singapore government. There are a lot of uh, companies to uh, research on substance uh, energy. So thank you for patient China. <laughs> yeah, one one com one more comment about China. I I listened to a person who I believe was one of the top in authority on what they're doing with their uh, energy standards. What their policy is on each technology, as soon as they get to a technology which is more energy efficient or more carbon uh, friendly, then they change the standard. While in the U.S., with our vehicles, for example, the automobile industry and the fossil fuel industry fought tooth and nail for decades and kept the vehicle efficiency standard at 24 miles a gallon or whatever it was for decades rather than as soon as what you really need to do is move that technology as fast as you can and we need a policy that says that's what we should do rather than having to fight industry for decades to get a change so that was why I'm a little more optimistic about what's happening Thank you very much. We're, we're grateful, Dr. Hansen, both for your being here and for your work on this important and critical, critical issue.